Welcome to the second CSP seminar. So today is our great pleasure to have Professor Lindy from the uh, Mathematics Department in UC Berkeley to give us a talk. Professor uh, Lin's research is mainly focused on quantum many-body problems, uh, and his work has won many awards, including uh, Sloan Fellowship, uh, Simon's Investigator Award, PICAS Award, etc. So today he will give us a talk on quantum signal processing. So let's look at Thanks, Jane, for the kind invitation. I very much apologize for missing the, the flight and missing the uh, like a scheduled meeting earlier today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something related to quantum computation. But if you're not familiar with quantum computation, don't worry. There will be very little about the quantum computer itself. Also, I want to uh, have a uh, put a disclaimer first that after the talk, you might feel either very disappointed or very excited or something, because uh, 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 I realized the name of the seminar series is a signal processing seminar, but quantum signal processing is really like a misnomer, but I'm not responsible for it. It's uh, more about uh, polynomial representation and, uh, uh, and the optimization that are relevant for quantum computation. Okay, so this is a joint work with the uh, excellent students, uh, Yu Long Dong and Jia Su Wang who, uh, from the uh, math department at the Berkeley, also Hong Kong Li, uh, who did the work as an undergrad and he just started in Stanford as a grad student. Also earlier work with another undergrad, Xiang Men, and he's now in MIT, and the professor Brigitte Willy, who's a professor who is a, a, a faculty member at the Berkeley in the chemistry department. So I'm going to introduce you the problem. Uh, I will talk about what is symmetric QSP and the iterative algorithm related to optimization. And if time allows, I'll talk about something called infinite QSP. So uh, a talk on quantum uh, computation often starts with a, a quote from Feynman, because allegedly uh, more than 40 years ago in this uh, first conference uh, in MIT, uh, Feynman said that if we want to solve quantum many-body problems in general, it is better to make a quantum computer. And uh, at that time, not that many took it very seriously. Now we have all heard from this or that things, people take it very seriously. So this talk uh, is really about uh, representing polynomials uni using unitary matrices. Why? Because quantum computer, roughly speaking, is a very big machine that is uh, built to do one thing and one thing only. That is, you multiply unitary matrices to very large, multiply very large unitary matrices to very large vectors. Uh, so fundamentally a linear algebra problem. Why unitary matrices? Because uh, nature, you know, qu according to quantum mechanics, propagates under the Schrodinger equation, which gives you unitary dynamics. So everything is unitary. Uh, but a lot of the things we are interested in, they're non-unitary. Okay, you can see that uh, this is a fundamentally uh, fundamentally you know, mismatch. Uh, specifically, a lot of problems we're interested in can be uh, written in the form of a polynomial function. Uh, if we want to solve uh, AX equals to B, which is a very common uh, scientific computing problem, you can say that I solve it with uh, like a Gauss elimination, so on and so forth. You can also say that I construct a FA, which is A inverse, and then apply to B, right? So uh, A inverse is not a polynomial, but I can approximate it by a polynomial. So that you have a polynomial representation. <laughs> or if I want to solve a heat equation, then essentially you are doing like e to the minus A, so on and so forth. They're just numerous examples. None of this is unitary. In the past few years, uh, starting from around 2017, uh, by a paper of Lowe and Isaac Tron, uh, Tron, if you, uh, 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 took like introduction to quantum computation. There is a book, uh, very famous, called the Nielsen Tron. So the same one. Uh, so they came up with a method called quantum signal processing. As I said, I'm not responsible for the name, uh, and uh, it really uh, summarizes uh, and generalizes a lot of the ideas done in the previous decade. And uh, the, this line of work culminates in uh, work by Gideon, Su, Lo, and Weeb, uh, uh, stuck in 2019 called the quantum singular value transformation. I was uh, at U Toronto uh, 
like uh, uh, yesterday given the seminar and uh, uh, yeah, Nathan Wee was uh, in the audience. And uh, there are also some very recent things from his group as well along this direction. So uh, uh, what this thing does is uh, using a polynomial representation, which will span the entire lecture. And then it says, once you can have this polynomial representation, you can very efficiently implement FA, which is here for arbitrary large A. Okay, this A can be a million by million, a trillion by a trillion, it just doesn't matter. So uh, you have a so-called quantum circuit, which means a quantum algorithm to implement that. Uh, so you can think roughly, there are two type, two parts of the statement. One is how do you represent a polynomial? Okay, which is actually the entire talk will never go beyond two by two matrices. Uh, the next is, how do you go from two by two to two trillion by two trillion? The second part is completely like machinery, which I will not touch at all, because uh, I mean, it requires a lot more on quantum computation. So the, this talk will be on the first part, which is about quantum signal processing. If you're interested, uh, so Isak Tron uh, and his group wrote a, a tutorial called the Grand Unification of Quantum Algorithms two years ago. Uh, so in this seminal paper, uh, many algorithms are unified, suggesting a grand unification of quantum algorithms. What it means is that a lot of the tasks, not everything, but let's say 70% of the quantum algorithms ever discovered since Feynman, uh, can be written in a way that is like uh, FA times B. Uh, many things are not, some are more uh, like uh, obvious, uh, like well, solve AX equals to B before a known algorithm for the Harrow, Hazardim, Lloyd, HHL algorithm. That's definitely in the category. Some are less obvious, uh, like uh, some Grover search or even improved version of Grover search. It, I mean, by a search is related to this problem. It turns out it is. And many others, uh, they can all be written in the same way. And the quantum single value transformation provides a unification of near optimal implementation in all of those. So that's why this thing matters. If uh, you're interested in, uh, uh, I recommend reading this tutorial. So um, as I said, this talk is about two by two matrices. So it's a game. So what's the rule of the game? Uh, there are two matrices that will uh, play roles throughout the talk. Uh, one is uh, uh, called a single qubit, which means of, di of dimension two. One is called a Pauli X, zero, one, one, zero. The other is Pauli Z, one, zero, zero, minus one. And for each lowercase x, uh, which is in the interval uh, minus one to one, uh, if it is equal to cosine theta, okay? I mean, I can always write a number uh, from minus one to one as a cosine theta. Uh, so this one, uh, there's a corresponding rotation matrix called the WX. WX is e to the i theta times capital X, which is this one. So it is uh, called the Pauli X rotation. Uh, theta equals R cosine X, and you just uh, plug it in, do the computation, you realize it's this matrix. It's a two by two rotation matrix, okay? Which is uh, unitary because here it is unitary. It's not only unitary, the determinant is one, so it is in SU2. Now the game is, I'm gonna construct uh, uh, another two by two matrix in this way. Uh, I choose d plus one phase factors. Uh, they're real, t1, da, 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 to phi d. Uh, I'm gonna alternately do e to the i phi z, wx, or e to the i theta x, e to the i phi one z, wx. So the important thing is wx is always the same thing, but all these phase factors can change. Uh, just to, to do uh, exercise, e to the i phi, Z, Z is one, zero, zero, minus one is this matrix. Okay, WX is written on the board. Uh, so so uh, each of this is SU2, SU2 is a group, you multiply them together, it's still in SU2. The game is if I give you a target polynomial of degree D, satisfying some assumption, I would like to embed this polynomial, which is definitely non-unitary, as a part of a unitary matrix, but in a very special way. So this U 
which is which depends on x and some adjustable parameters. You can smell that later. I'm going to optimize. So this u has four entries. I don't care about any of these things. This one is a complex number. I don't even care about what the imaginary part is. I only care about the real part should be my target polynomial fx. Okay, so this is the game. If you can do this, then by the previous grand unification paper, you can lift this up to become a quantum circuit and solve properly. Black magic, yeah, but, uh, uh, but uh, this is uh, how the game works. Um, it's a problem very new. Uh, I asked many uh, this question in like a, a, a number of uh, applications, uh, formally and informally, to various people. Uh, like, have you seen this kind of thing? No. I mean, it seems to be genuinely new coming out of the quantum algorithm community. I mean, although polynomial representations, uh, I mean, 50, 100, 150 year old, uh, but uh, this seems to be just new. People haven't studied this before. Um, we have a like a software package uh, called the QSP pack, and you can uh, uh, download that from the uh, from the website. Uh, so I'm gonna do a few MATLAB demonstrations for this. I probably need to just share the entire screen. Uh, I want to show that. So this is the uh, website uh, slide. I mean, there's a GitHub. You can download the uh, the code. And there are many examples how to use this to solve quantum linear system problem. Uh, there are quantum time tunnel simulation, Gaussian filter, many, many examples. Okay, I'm not going to show you all, but I'm going to show you a few uh, simple examples. One is I claim I can use this to uh, represent uh, polynomials. I got a start from something simple. How about Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind? Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind is denoted by tdx, that is cosine d times theta. It's just to rotate d times. Uh, theta is r cosine x, OK? So this one uh, uh, looks a bit weird if this is the first time you see it, but it is a pretty natural thing, cosine d r cosine x. So that's called the Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind. How do I choose the phase factors so that the resulting thing satisfies this? So this is cosine. Any? Yes. So uh, where is the prescription from for D coming in here? Uh, D, yeah. uh, D is here. You see, the length is D, mm -hmm. and I would like to get like a cosine D theta. Okay. Yeah, so, it's not a coincidence. Oh, I see. Okay. It's not a coincidence. Yeah. Can you guess? What the approach is made? Uh, not approximate, it's the exact. Oh, exactly. It's the exact, no error. So, uh, number, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so how do I choose this uh, d plus one numbers? What, why not do you use one times one? Just what? use a complex number. Oh, no. Uh, when... uh, everything has to be unitary. So, oh. this f plus i, this is still not of normal one. So, uh, the really the uh, so uh, really I mean you the the smallest thing you can do is like two by two. Okay. How do I do that? Yeah. Well, uh, students, are thinking to answer your question, I have a question. How restrictive is the limitation to the interval minus one to one in the? Application? No, that's just a without loss of generality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it has to be finite. finite. It has to be finite. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, since I asked, the answer must be simple, right? It couldn't be one One is uh, pi, I mean, the e to the, the 2.7. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the answer is all zero. So why? Is because each uh, wx is uh, e to the i theta x, is the x rotation. I set all of them to be zero. I just multiply W D times. That's e to the I D theta X. E to the I D theta X. So the uh, the uh, the the upper left entry is just a cosine D theta, which is cosine D R cosine X. Okay, so it works. But also I want to show you that it works with the code. Uh, 
so this is uh, some, uh, uh, oops, get rid of this part. So uh, this one, the error you can see, this is how I construct it. This is a target FX. The error is 10 to the minus 13 everywhere. If you look at the function values, it's a perfect matching. And uh, the angles, all zero. I mean, 10 to the minus six, but I can, it's a convergence criteria. Okay. Second question. How do I approach this FX is all zero? Okay, I mean, zero is the simplest polynomial you can think of, but it's not quite easy on a quantum computer, which can only do unitary things. So how do I uh, approach all zero? It's not quite obvious, but it's a simple answer. You almost have all zero, but on both sides, you put a pi over four. What's the reason? Because we know that if you put all zero, W to the D is a cosine D theta, the upper left part. You put pi over four on both sides, each of them is square root of I, multiply to together is I. So cosine theta becomes I cosine theta, take a real part, zero. Okay. So let me show you how this works. The code. So this is a phase factor on both sides of the pi over four, all zeros. And this is the function value, 10 to the minus 16. Okay. Second example. Third example. Uh, there's no way uh, you can stare at this and uh, no, I would just show you the works. Pick a linear combination of Chebyshev. This is the phase factor. Uh, but there's some structure here. So interestingly, so you see these two numbers, they just reverse the order. So there's some symmetry. This is the error, 10 to the minus 14. This is how it fits. And uh, the phase factor are this, good. Uh, it's a very faithful co computation. You just take this thing, multiply, and then yeah, take the real part, that's it. Yeah. So how can you prove that each answer is unique? Like, oh, no, it's not. Later you will see it's not unique at all. I'm just showing this is the answer. Then, then, then why do you call, um, I mean, why does you call converge to this answer? Not this converge. Answer. Oh, it shows that this is a answer. Okay. But this answer has a, a, a convert. Oh, uh, sorry. Converge to is because I'm running an iterative algorithm with, with my lab. I, that's how I will show. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so you solve these problems. I'll mention that. Yeah. Uh, here, first, I want to show you because it's a, such a weird setup. I just want to show you that it can represent some reasonable polynomial. Okay. Uh, I, let me just do some uh, uh, some pretty random polynomial. Yeah. Okay. So this is much more rap, uh, random. The phase factor satisfies some sort of a symmetry structure. It seems to work, and uh, the error is. Uh, uh, very small, 10 to minus 13. And again, 0 0.57, 0 0.57, minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.2. So it has some symmetry structure. How about smooth function? So I will approximate it very, very well by polynomial. Okay. And uh, yeah, this one you can see there's iteration going on. Uh, there's new behavior here. Uh, that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, phase factor, again, has, uh, uh, maybe let me first show that the error. Error is very small, 10 to the minus 13. Phase factor has a nearly pi over 4 on both sides, very close to 0. Let me extract this trivial pi over 4, because of this pi over 4 produces a 0 solution. I extract that. And then plot, plot the resulting phase factor on the log scale. You see, it decays exponentially here. There's some decay behavior. If you're familiar with the, well, this is signal processing. So if you have a smooth function, 
expand it. If it's a periodic, you expand it with a Fourier series, it decays super polynomially. If you have a more general function on the finite interval, you expand it with a Chebyshev polynomial, it decays super polynomially. So the phase factor somehow also exhibits this kind of behavior. So that is kind of interesting, especially later you will see that this is not quite expected at all, given how complicated this problem is. Um, and then I want to show that uh, computing the phase factors used to be, which means in 2018, was considered to be really hard. Uh, this is a paper by Andrew Childers' group in 2018 PNAS, uh, compares a bunch of methods for doing so-called Hamiltonian simulation. In the appendix, there is a paragraph. Specifically, we found the time required to compute the phase factors, they call angles, are prohibitive when the degree is 32. Because uh, it's very nonlinear mapping, right? I mean, there's phase and there's target polynomial. If you just search, it just doesn't work. So it's a prohibitively expensive. Tremendous progress has been made along this direction in the past five years. Uh, right, actually, it's around the same time during the PNAS, and the uh, QFVT paper came out. Also, there, or around the same time, uh, Juwan Ha wrote the paper. They formulated a systematic method to find the phase factors by computing the roots of a high degree polynomial to high precision. High precision, I really mean high precision. If you do double precision arithmetic operation, it just doesn't work. And uh, you need to keep it to 300 or 1,000 digits or something. But if you can do this type of calculations, then you can find the phase factors, which means from the perspective uh, language of numerical analysis, this method works, but it's not a numerically stable algorithm. It, uh, the number of bits increases uh, with respect to, is it proportional to the degree rather than proportional to the log of the degree. So it's not a numerically stable algorithm. Uh, Chaudo uh, proposed an empirical method called the capitalization that seems to work for very large degrees uh, uh, without the uh, without uh, uh, using uh, the double precision arithmetic, without the high precision arithmetic. Last year, Lexin Ying at Stanford uh, proposed a method based on Prunis method, again, very signal processing, and uh, that, uh, uh, again, solved the problem beautifully, but uh, without proof. We specialize in iterative methods. We first uh, propose optimization-based methods to find these phase factors, and without proof, but later we give a uh, convergence proof in the limited sense. Then we extended this with a much simpler algorithm for the fixed point iteration, but also with improved convergence analysis. Uh, most recently, uh, we had this Newton's method, which is much more robust and even for challenging cases. I won't talk about the Newton's case, but I'm going to show you the example. So this is a polynomial degree of a um, I forgot, like a 1500 or something, pretty large, uh, converges to 10 to the minus 14 in three iterations. Uh, decay, the same thing you have seen before. Phase factor, symmetric, error 10 to the minus 13. And if you look at uh, extremely oscillatory, it's a cosine some 1,000 times tau. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a very hard, and uh, but... Uh, uh, you can solve it. So tremendous progress has been made in the past few years. Um, I don't think I'll demonstrate more examples. So uh, we can robustly solve to D. I remember D is 32. Now we can robustly solve to like 1,000 or 10,000. Uh, practically, the problem solved within five years. Last month, uh, Nathan Weep, the same uh, from Toronto, and uh, 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 with his I thought at uh, the beginning, I thought the postdoc turns out to be undergrad student uh, in the year. Uh, posted this paper, beautiful paper, does two things. One is uh, 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 generalized, it generalizes the application range of QSP. It's not only uh, restricted to the thing I'm talking about today, but a little bit more general. Two is they also improve the algorithm. Uh, I think there is a, in the paper, there's a sentence previous works only did this for 10 to the 4. Remember, a couple of years ago, 32 was a prohibitively expensive. Previous work only pushed the 10 to the four, we go to 10 to the seven. Um, so I, I, yeah, uh, but I think the core part of the argument, if we push as hard, we probably can go there too. 
But uh, I just want to say that tremendous progress we really made. What is this thing? Uh, so the any question? Before I proceed, yeah. yeah. So how do you? Uh, so in five years, we've had like a large increase in computational power. So like, how do you? No, it has nothing to do with that. Okay. It's really because if you do a brute force search, it's got stuck the local minima all the time. Now we have just all various various ways to either completely characterize the landscape or uh, magically avoid the problem. So now I'm going to talk about it. Yeah. It's just to help me follow the big picture. So you're talking about computing offline with conventional computing these these phase factors that yeah. then somehow yeah somehow get that into quantum computing. Yeah, that's the beautiful part of it. Because uh, before the algorithms is uh, you need to compute the phase factors effectively on the quantum computer, which is uh, way harder. Uh -huh. So being able to compute it offline is a uh, 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 yeah, is a is a significant advance. Okay, so the goal recall that the goal of QSP, as I said, at this point, I think you should either leave. <laughs> the room because I realize that's nothing to do with the signal processing, right? I mean, polynomial representation, or you're intrigued why uh, why this thing can work. So, uh, 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 so the uh, the QSP is a map that maps d plus one factors uh, to a degree d real polynomial. Uh, so I multiply them together, and uh, as I said, this two by two matrix. I only care about the upper left part. Natural question, what for what kind of polynomials I can really re represent using uh, uh, such a representation? Uh, the seminal paper, uh, GSLW, the QSVT paper, gives a complete answer to this. So for any polynomial uh, that uh, is of, uh, uh, has a fixed parity, uh, why has to have fixed parity? You can directly check. I mean, it's not obvious if you check it right now, but if you just check it, you realize this thing can either be even or odd, cannot be a linear combination. It's just, uh, I mean, the nature of the problem. So it has a fixed parity, and uh, the no infinite norm, that is the max of the absolute value between minus one and one, is bounded by one. That's again very natural because it's supposed to be embedded in a unitary thing. In the unitary matrix, nothing can be bigger than one, right? So to most natural condition, then there exists phase factors to represent that. It doesn't say about the uniqueness, but uh, you can do it. And again, uh, this paper from a couple of weeks ago removes the parity constraint, but uh, you uh, need to work with a bit more general conditions. Uh, uniqueness, obviously not unique. Why? because your function is a real function. So all the coefficients are real. And then it's, it's, it has a fixed parity. So it's even or odd. So that gets rid of half of the degree of freedom. But you have d plus one factors. So the number of variables is way more than the number of equations you have. So it's not possible to be unique. But one natural way to enforce uniqueness, I mean, you, you will have all sorts of non-symmetric solutions, but uh, you can enforce the uniqueness by requiring the phase factors to have this condition. It's not obvious why you want to impose this thing, but uh, from all the previous examples, I hopefully I showed you that you can, right? But by enforcing this symmetry conditions, this leaves the symmetric QSP. And nominally, the number of degrees of freedom, number of variables matches the number of uh, uh, equations you have. Is that still going to be able to represent all the polynomials? Uh, we give a positive answer, yes. So again, if f has a fixed parity under exactly the same condition, then there exist symmetric phase factors. So you don't lose anything by restricting to uh, symmetric phase factors. You're still going to solve the problem. Now you have hope of uh, seeing uniqueness. Now, at least uh, the number uh, on both sides matches. I can do some optimization. If the numbers don't match, you can think, you can see that if I do some optimization, then uh, the, the Hessian or the Jacobian or something, I mean, it must be very bad for the local minima uh, or global minima. So now you have some hope of uh, uh, doing uh, with the optimization. So you just uh, search over uh, uh, d, uh, d tilde, which is roughly d over two, number of degrees of freedom. And uh, you can sample, for example, on the Chepchef node, 
and I solve brute force rate this minimization problem. Uh, the objective function is the real part, right? And uh, the top left entry real part needs to match a target polynomial at many points. Okay, and actually you only need those many details at many points. Uh, the uh, uh, when you reach the global minimum, which should be zero, because it's a representation, it's not approximation, uh, you should have this is just equal. So the uh, 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 at the global minimum, f theta needs to be zero, um, right? And this is optimization problem. Um, then we need to ask, what's the landscape? At the beginning, we were very excited uh, because this is a, a degree two, degree three polynomial with a fixed parity. You just search a bit, you find, oh yeah, there are a few global minima, uh, but you can well quickly see that they are kind of related to each other by symmetry. So that we're not worried and you just search. I mean, it's not a hard problem at all. And um, you just increase the degree a little bit and realize, no, there are genuine global local minima. And there are numerous of those. Then we feel like, okay, this is gonna be in trouble because this kind of explains why we just start from random guess. I mean, that optimization does not work at all. You just got stuck in local minimum all the time. Uh, it turns out the problem is even worse. Uh, there are combinatorially many global minima, combinatorial with respect to D, and even more local minima. So uh, let me first now show you what's the progress made to exactly characterize all this combinatorially many global minima, uh, which led to this factorization. This is indeed a very beautiful idea. Uh, but um, uh, to do this, uh, you have to find enough condition to tell to, to say when the solution is unique. Then you can say, I want to enumerate all the global uh, minima. Uh, it turns out we can find the condition so that the, uh, the, the phase factor is unique. So you need, now need to add a bit, bit more things. This more things you don't need to remember. Uh, they're technical. Roughly speaking, uh, the things you need to know are this star and this star and this star and this star. Okay, You specify all these things. Uh, so you're given a real part f. You want to find the imaginary part, this Q thing uh, together, form a unitary matrix under some other technical conditions, then boom, unique. You can show that, that for each of this, once you are given P and Q, called the complementary polynomials, then the phase factor is indeed unique under symmetry condition. With this, you can start characterizing uh, all the global minima without specifying, that also explains why there are so many global minima, because you didn't, you didn't specify this thing, this thing. So now what I showed you is really there is a bijection between all the global minima of the optimization problem and all the admissible complementary polynomials so that the real part of P is my target function. Does this logic make sense? So, the thing is, how do I find all the complementary polynomials? This is where the factorization algorithm came in. Uh, it's a longer, it's much longer than this. I'll just tell you the gist of it, but it's a very beautiful mathematics. Uh, so uh, there's a condition here. Looks really weird the first time you see it. But if you think about it, this is a very natural condition because of this unitary matrix. This thing square plus this thing square needs to be equal to one. That's exactly this condition. But the p square is fx square plus imaginary square. So and the f square is known. So I can move things to the right hand side. I have this equation: one minus f square, the target function, equal to this type square plus this square. So then the question is: once I know f. How do I find this P imaginary in the Q? This is their, uh, the breakthrough, the first breakthrough to find uh, uh, all this P imaginary in the Q. Uh, uh, it turns out looking at this problem is hard. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if you, uh, is the, the much better method is to lift it, this up to the, to the complex domain, uh, to the complex plane, 
uh, called the Laurent construct, the so-called Laurent polynomial. Sounds like fancy, but uh, let me just write down so one line thing. That is, uh, so if you have any, uh, the idea is that x equal to cosine theta, you can always write it as a one half e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta. This is equal to one half z plus z inverse, right? If z is e to the i theta. But that means I'm restricting z to the unit circle on the complex plane. Now I need to factorize f z plus z inverse over two squared. F is a polynomial, but f viewed as z and z inverse has both is a polynomial of z and z inverse. It is called the Laurent polynomial, and you factorize that. And uh, after that, you do some manipulation, and you will be able to find all the global minimizers. So the original problem paper uh, it has some uh, holes in it. We fixed that, but uh, 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 yeah, you can find all the global uh, minimizer. Why do you need a high precision ar arithmetic operation? This one, you can find all roots with high to high precision. That's the problem. Okay, this is the factorization algorithm. Uh, the relation to this talk is not to say I'm going to go on to find all this global minimizer. I just need to find one of them. Uh, instead, what it says is if you, because you know the structure so well, at least conceptually, we know that uh, the energy landscape must be very hard. Therefore, that leads to this uh, strange thing called a magical initial guess. So, so here you calculate the probability condition, but you still can have like other local minimizers. Right, yeah, the local minimizer, the numerous, we don't know how to characterize it, but uh, numerically, you just see they're all over the place. Yeah, you, if you randomly start, you don't convert to any of this global minima, you convert to the even more local minima. So the landscape is really complicated, okay? Despite the very complicated landscape, there exists this magical initial guess. This magical initial guess is nothing but the one that produces a zero here. This is used in QSP pack in all examples. So far, with all the randomization and other things, it never failed. It's never failed. It's so strange. I mean, it's not like with the probability 50 or something, it works. It just never fails. Uh, as I said, it corresponds to uh, this setting where the real part of P is zero. Imagine the part is uh, the Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind. Just the one special solution corresponding to fx equals zero. Why does it work? That's the mystery and the question so far. Yeah. I never failed. Uh, we we'll just test it and. Do you mean like uh, the function should still satisfy yeah. uh, the conditions and this theorem? Yeah. I mean, just to try some random thing. I mean, somehow you just, this is the thing that you start. You start from here, the works, you start from some something else, random thing, it just doesn't work. But uh, start from here, it works. Really strange. Uh, this is to say that at least locally, you have some hope uh, because if you don't have a symmetry condition, you uh, look at the minimum, the Hessian, uh, the smallest the single value is like 10 to the minus 17. So, I mean, very ill conditioned. You cannot have a like exponential convergence or linear convergence. Depends on the language, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if you have a symmetry condition locally, actually, it is very good. So the small minimum singular value is bounded away from zero. Uh, this one is uh, to compare the optimization based algorithm with the earlier factorization based algorithm. Factorization, as you can see, tau equal to five hundred requires number of bits like 3,000. You need to keep 3,000 bits of precision. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Took a, maybe uh, the 500 took about uh, uh, a couple of hours to run. Uh, and I showed you how equal to 1,500 earlier, right? Much higher end, boom, 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 three iterations works. So there's a there's big difference. Why does it work? The first uh, uh, thing we try to do was to characterize the local energy landscape. 
we want to show that it is locally, uh, uh, it is lo it is a convex. But unlike the uh, the typical argument saying that around the local global minima, uh, there exists a region. You start from here and uh, uh, it converges. This one we have to show that it converges starting from a fixed initial guess, right? So, so for any target function, you start from a fixed one, it converges. It's a very, it, despite the complex energy landscape. So this is kind of like a weird result. Of course, the two scenarios, I said, they're not too different. So this is what we exploited back then. We assume that the F is not too far away from zero. Because if zero, then that's like the power of four, zero to zero power of four. We assume that the magnitude of, of the F infinity norm is uh, slightly above zero. So D inverse, D is the degree. It's kind of tiny, but even that tiny is not that obvious why this works. So if this is small, if it's this small, then there exists a neighborhood around that. So the Hessian is indeed locally convex. Once you're there, then you just do some projected gradient and it will converge exponentially. Have a, this type of convergence behavior. So that's the first result. But the dependence on D inverse is very undesirable because what if you want to approximate a smooth function? It means the, the, the higher degree you go and uh, the smaller function value it is, and uh, it will end up with a, like, a very small success probability in the quantum computer. So that's not good. To improve this, we uh, we realize we have to go to the infinitely long phase sequence. Why? It's because the uh, the the proof goes like uh, I can bound each entry of the Hessian, and then I bound the entire Hessian. But when you go from an entry-wise norm to a spectral norm, you always lose with respect to the dimension. So you have to find a space that you can bound something without despite the matrix size is growing. But then uh, you're not that far away from doing an infinite thing. So that's very naturally infinite QSP. So the, uh, the problem of uh, infinite QSP can be mentioned as follows, stated as follows. You have a smooth function that can be expanded using chapter polynomials is even or odd, but they're infinite. Uh, it's infinitely long. I truncated this trap chef polynomial because uh, some of the coefficients are so small after some threshold. And uh, uh, I truncated, I got a polynomial called FD. Because of the representation theorem, we know that there exist phase factors that can represent this FD. So uh, we want to ask a convergence problem. That is, if each of this F D has a symmetric phase factor called a phi D, then does this set of phase factors converge as D equals infinity converts somewhere? And can we characterize that phase factor somewhere? And okay. So as I said, the motivation uh, for this was really try to get a better bound saying uh, you don't need to scale your function down by one over D. A little bit fancier way of talking about this is that we have a sequence of Chebyshev polynomials or Chebyshev coefficients called CD. Each of them corresponds to a target function that converges. So the converges in the sense that the uh, Chebyshev coefficients will converge called the C star. So it starts from I infinity. R infinity is just an infinitely long sequence, but only finite of those are non-zero. Uh, it doesn't have distance or something. Uh, to have a distance, to say convergence, you need to have a distance. Uh, turns out the most natural one is L1. You just add absolute value of one of those. The small L1 norm is the uh, natural way of characterizing a distance. So I know that uh, for every Chebyshev polynomial, there exists a symmetric phase factor that maps to the Chebyshev polynomial. I subtract the pi over four trivial pi over four on both sides. So a bunch of close to zero things on both sides. And I ask whether this coefficient converts to phi star in L1 and whether this can be mapped to the C star. 
that's the question of infinite QSP. Does it make sense? It's a little bit abstract, but uh, uh, yeah, any, maybe a possible second. Okay. So uh, the, que the previous question becomes uh, whether this mapping, this extension is well defined, and whether I can inversely solve the phase factors for infinite long sequence. Okay, optimization problem is even harder. Now it's infinite dimension. Uh, you can prove that this works. So this uh, there exists a unique uh, 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 universal constant, so that if the Chebyshev coefficients they are uh, uh, can be infinitely long. Their L1 norm is bounded, then you will be able to invert the map and uh, to find the phase factors also in the L1 group. So that solves a uh, uh, most important problem uh, that was mentioned earlier, which is uh, the dimension dependence. This argument doesn't have any dimension dependence. So the way to prove this is to construct the algorithm. And uh, that's a much simpler algorithm than the optimization algorithm I showed you earlier. Earlier, I write down optimization algorithm. I still need to uh, compute the, yeah, I mean, the gradient to do some quasi Newton. This one, the, the whole code is one line. Okay, I mean, a pseudo code is one line. Remember, such a complicated nonlinear mapping, I claim you can just run this one line code and that works. That's the fixed point iteration. So we want to solve a nonlinear equation problem. It maps the phase factor to Chebyshev coefficients. What I know is the Chebyshev coefficients of what I want is this phase factor. I run the fixed point iteration. This one half comes from analysis of the, uh, the Jacobian at uh, uh, the trivial all zero vector. So it's like a kind of like a Newton thing. So you just uh, iterate starting from zero to zero. Okay, starts from zero, uh, the, the, the trivial phase factor, and just keep running this. It's gonna converge under some conditions. So uh, what you can show is that there exists universal constants. I mean, th those are not existence. I mean, we know precisely the upper bound of those. So if there are these constants, so that if the initial target function has a one norm that's bounded by something, then the, this fixed point iteration is going to converge to the one set of phase factors. There are combinatorially many. I, I don't talk about others, but at least this one branch, it is going to converge to it. Yeah. On the previous slide, do you have any sort of like intuition from where this universal constant comes from? Oh, it's just a technical computation. Yeah, universal just mean, means that it doesn't depend on your target function. It just pops out of yeah, that group. pops out of the computation. You, yeah, there are a bunch of so, yeah. It's, it's not some uh, uh, even grander <laughs> yeah thing. It's just a, yeah. There's zero point nine something. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, no, so then if you start from this thing, uh, yeah, you your function satisfies this, and uh, uh, you start from the all zero solution, it's gonna converge. So this type of analysis is going to be completely different from, uh, let's say, from optimization perspective. You start from a neighborhood. I mean, that would depend on F, right? I mean, you, it pretty much means that you have a very precise characterization of this uh, so-called uh, small neighborhood around the global solution from that. You can put, you know, you, this one, you start from fixed point, uh, fixed initial guess, and there is no explicit dependence on D to show that it works. Um, <clears throat> this even outperforms the previous optimization algorithm by maybe about the order of magnitude in terms of speed. And the complexity is a polynomial degree squared log one over epsilon. It's both theoretical and numerical. The last topic is the decay behavior. So uh, if you're given uh, Fx, you expand it into Chebyshev polynomial, then if it is uh, smooth, then the because of the duality between uh, between Fourier space and the real space, the Chebyshev polynomial it is going to decay super polynomially or exponentially it depends on the analyticity. So uh, uh, these are indeed the case. You look at 
these three applications corresponds to three different functions. They're all smooth. So the Hamiltonian simulation looks like a, a cosine tau x. As tau becomes large, you can see that it is a pretty oscillatory, means that many of the coefficients, uh, they don't decay. But once you resolve beyond like uh, one over tau, uh, beyond tau, then you don't have things become smooth on that scale. So it decays very rapidly. That's how you see this. Uh, eigenstate filtering is like a Gaussian. Uh, solving linear systems like A inverse. Okay, so three, uh, on uh, excluding the region around the x equals zero. So they are all smooth. And the championship coefficients, which is the uh, green line, so they do decay. But at least on the log scale, on the linear scale, it doesn't look obvious. On the log scale, the phase factor is very closely tracks the Chebyshev decay of the Chebyshev coefficients. Why? In the earlier paper, we provided a perturbative explanation why this is the case. But now we have non-perturbative explanation because of this fixed point iteration. So what you can characterize is that there exist universal constants so that the tail of the phase factor, at least for this branch of the solution. Remember, it's a really remarkable result because there are combinatorially many solutions of the symmetric ones. There are even more non-symmetric ones. Somehow you can pick this one branch of the solution and say something very specific about this branch. Okay, so, so this branch, uh, we give a name called the maximal solution because of some technical maximality. But uh, this branch of the solution satisfies the tail of the uh, phase factor is essentially like it acts like isometry between the Fourier domain and the phase factor domain. So the if the if the Chebyshev it decays and the phase factor decays and the tracks very very well. So essentially it's a almost like a scaled version of the Chebyshev, but it's not because the C1 and C2 they cannot get them close to one. Like a, maybe you're bounded by 0 0.3, 0 uh, 1.5 something. Is it's not like a simple relation, but the asymptotic behavior there, they agree with each other. Let me show you how sharp the result is. If fx is uh, 0 0.8 times x cubed, kind of weird, from ab x absolute value cube, x cube is simple, it's three degree three, x absolute value cube, it has cusp, uh, uh, the, the fourth order, the third order derivative has cusp, right? And, uh, 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 so the Chebyshev coefficients would decay like k to the minus four as algebraic decay, and the phase factors closely traps that algebraic decay. And if this is super algebraic decay, and the decay is super algebraic, so this is a very sharp result. So this is like you're implementing. Uh, I mean, quantum computer is great for doing multiplication. It's not only great for doing multiplication; it's only designed to do matrix multiplication. It's a, you, you have a starting from vector, you multiply, you multiply, and multiply, then you do some elements. That's all quant, how all quantum algorithms look like. It's not great to add things up. I, I have a, you can do it in, with the various tricks, but it's not natively designed to do it. And uh, Chebyshev polynomial, they're useful because you linearly combine Chebyshev polynomials to come up with all sorts of functions. But this uh, uh, quantum signal processing essentially says that you can achieve linear combination of Chebyshev polynomial. And actually, if you look at the phase factors, so something really, really like Chebyshev, Chebyshev polynomial, all using multiplication without ever using addition. Very intriguing thing. OK, let me conclude. So, uh, uh, so hopefully. Uh, this uh, gives you something to think about. I mean, it's a very new thing, only appeared in the scientific literature. I mean, such a mathematical object, but it only appeared in the scientific literature in the past few years, right? And uh, it's a polynomial representation using parts of a unitary matrix. Uh, this idea is called a block encoding, is a recent thing that unifies many quantum algorithms. I mean, you find it's really a natural language to talk about the many algorithms. You have a non-unitary thing. You want to block encode with a unitary part. Uh, we showed that iterative, me iterative methods can survive 
even in the presence of such a complicated energy landscape. Uh, I'm not sure whether, I mean, how general this obs observation is, but even for this, uh, uh, like, uh, isolated singular phenomena on its own, I think is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, so hopefully there could be a lot more structure that can be discovered, given also a few weeks ago, there's a generalized QST, maybe there's even more work to do. Uh, from a problem independent initial guess, and can, so, so just very weird. Uh, uh, there's a surprising relation between a branch of a phase factor. What happens to other branches of phase factors? Our paper has a bit of characterization of those, and uh, yeah, and they all seem to do something, and uh, so it's uh, uh, surprising. Also, surprising relation between the regularity of the target function and the decay of the phase factor. There are a lot of open questions. Let me uh, like uh, say maybe two of them. Uh, one is uh, why iterative methods, I mean, can work when tau is large. So it seems like we have already uh, uh, proved that uh, when uh, 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 the chapter coefficients, the one norm is bounded by constant the convergence. What else is needed to be proven? Look at this. So the tau, uh, when tau is large, uh, the Chebyshev coefficients for a long time just doesn't decay at all. So the one norm of the Chebyshev coefficients is going to grow linearly with respect to tau. It can easily exceed that constant bound, but the method still works. Why does it work? That's one thing. Even harder question is when c goes towards one. C goes towards one. I mean, when tau is large, you can show that the Jacobian is still good, or the Hessian is uh, still good. But when C goes to close to one, both numerically and theoretically shows that the Jacobian or the Hessian becomes very ill-conditioned. You can still come up with methods that works very well. Why is that, why is that the case? So um, yeah, and with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. That's the end for the great talk. Any, any questions? So, uh, you know that this, uh, like, initialization works, and then you do a theory that locally, uh, local convert. So does your, like, initialization practice satisfy that condition? Uh, you, you can, for, for uh, uh, small c, it indeed satisfies that. So, uh, what we proved, uh, uh, yeah, the, so this is the stronger result, which doesn't explicitly evolve the initialization, but you have to start from that. Mm -hmm. So when C or the one norm is bounded by like 0 0.7 or something, then you start what we prove is you start from that initial condition or zero. It is indeed inside of the bowl of a contraction and therefore it contracts. That's a, how, yeah, how to prove that. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. I have a very general question. Yeah, I wonder what, what's the main difference between the quantum optimization and the classical optimization. This is completely classical, <laughs> right? There is no quantum. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but the idea is that uh uh, uh the uh, yeah the, the 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 difference between uh the, there is a completely different thing called a qu uh, yeah quantum optimization, but this one is not. This one is to say okay, there is the great work done by this and uh, this one tells you a lot of the work that is supposed to be done on quantum computers can be offloaded to classical computers. So let's solve them. I see. Yeah, so, so it's not a typical quantum optimization. Except the uh, variable, see, it, yeah, the, be, the parameters. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So, so it's not a typical yeah. quantum optimization. Uh, I have a question. Uh, why is this QSP problem important since you use many quantum surveys to feed just uh, uh, a quantum gate and the, only the upper left. And yeah, uh, I recommend reading this paper, why this is important. <laughs> so as I said, I offload the importance thing to yeah, defer to this paper. Uh, hopefully, yeah, the title, can, yeah. Uh, yeah, convinces you. It, it, it's not necessarily grand unification or something, but uh, there's some significance. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, nowadays, the deep learning is very popular, right? Is there any interaction that we can do uh, between the 
Uh, could be. I mean, lot, many people do the, I mean, quantum neural network, but uh, this is a, quite different, right? So uh, I, I think the uh, uh, a general trend is that uh, the in quantum, because things are so linear, uh, oh, this is not a, uh, not a linear map, because there are a lot of things that are linear, uh, it turns out you can say more, uh, more concretely, uh, about the behavior of quantum systems than, let's say, classical neural network, which is a completely nonlinear parameterization. Uh, so many people in the field uh, they, uh, uh, prefer not to involve deep learning whenever possible. But uh, I mean, uh, and also it's, a, it's like, um, uh, uh, it's like a, we don't have a working quantum computer. So it's not like you can try a lot of things, right? When we have a working quantum computer, the landscape will look very different. But uh, for now, uh, I think uh, 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 most of the works are still, uh, yeah, you, you write on paper and uh, yeah, show that it works. Yeah. So we have this initial guess, this kind of problem independent. Um, and we also saw a lot of symmetry in the, in the lost landscape. Yeah. Is this, does this possibly, so do, you, do you think that there might be other sort of initial guesses that could give us similar convergence properties, maybe other solutions to the, Zero polynomial? They are. Uh, oh, uh, excellent guess. Uh, we actually tried that in the uh, in the quantum paper. Uh, quantum. Uh, oh, quantum means a, a quantum journal. Uh, this one. So uh, I didn't show in the top, but uh, if you look at the paper, indeed, starting from around other zero solutions to zero, uh, you can uh, converge. But it seems like the convergence rate is slower. Uh, the re uh, we don't understand the reason. Uh, you can explicitly, I mean, just uh, find uh, the convergence rate. Seems like this is a solution from all zero. This particular branch is doing something that's good. So, so, but it does work for any solution to this? We don't know whether it's any. We tried a few. Seems to work. Mm -hmm. But a random, no. So, uh, what if uh, the polynomials PM and Q in your, uh, the one that uh, appear in the unitary system, uh, like FX plus I, P, M, X, and then. So we don't explicitly construct the, the, the Q. Uh, you can think like we find a solution, right? A branch of the solution that defines P, I, M, Q. That's right. So what, uh, did you find anything interesting with? Uh, oh yeah, we actually know something, uh, again, from this paper, that, that solution corresponds to a particular way of choosing P, I, M, and Q. You can even construct. Uh, yeah. they, they, uh, they have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah. Well, yeah, we actually, yeah, we actually know a lot about that PIM and Q. But the point is, you want to construct it or implicitly construct it without finding all the zeros, which is uh, the costly and uh, non-stable step, unstable step. Good question. So I know it's a little bit past the math part, but when you go to implement, somebody goes to implement this in hardware and you have all these phase factors, the, the actual phases will not be what you designed, right? There's going to be some departure from that. So when you talk about numerical instability and local minimum, I start to worry like, okay, if my implemented phases don't match the optimized phases, does the whole thing, do you get a very bad approximation? Or no, no. no. In quantum, uh, everything is unitary. So the error always that mostly grows linearly. If you have some randomness, it even grows sublinearly. Yeah, so quantum, that's one of the good things about quantum system, uh, e either, I mean, um, bless or curse. I mean, it's a curse because you're so restricted uh, to unitary things, but uh, I mean, you just do the telescope bound and it always grows a sublinear. That's just a generic statement, not not would restrict it to this. So just a clarification of that question. So you're saying that if you have a, a small perturbation in the face, uh, in the faces, you will get just some. Yeah, small perturbation in the end. Uh, that's a generic statement. You have a, a circuit that is uh, like a uh, like a, a product of the D unitary matrices. Each one of them you perturb it by epsilon. In the end, you perturb by epsilon D. So it's a linear growth, uh, a sublinear growth. Any other questions? 
Oh, no, that's, that's good. Good.